Oh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday, November 20th, 22 meeting of the France and Colonies Philatelic Society in the United States. My name is Larry Rosenblum. I'm a director of the society and I am the host of today's meeting. We have a um, different format today than when we've been using. We have 10 show and tell uh, short presentations. Um, each presentation should be limited to about 10 minutes and um, we may have some brief discussion afterwards and then discussion at the end. So let me start um, sharing. I need to um, get the slides back here. Okay. So these slides were done by Ken. Um, I take no credit for his design, nor for any hunger pangs you may feel when you um, look at the slides. So Ken points out here that we have a variety of um, topics that we'll be covering. Um, a wide variety covering both grants and um, the colonies, as we call them in general. And here is the list of contents that we will be uh, talking about. So I will be presenting all the slides and each individual person will speak to them. And so let's get started with Tom. Um, can you unmute yourself and, um, uh, yes, am I uh, being heard? Yes. Good. I've always had an interest in the uh, Vichy stamps, uh, issued from 1941 to 1944, uh, by the Vichy regime in France. And those stamps, uh, were issued by the agents, uh, Comptable uh, uh, de Canberra Post uh, Colonial uh, in Paris. And the question is which of those stamps were used in the colonies? Over the years, there has been a lot of confusion in the colonies. And I think there still is about which stamps were actually distributed in which colonies, when were they released, uh, when were they devalued or demonetized. And there still seems to be a fair amount of confusion. There was an article from Linz in 2021 that just came out uh, about uh, the Vichy stamps. And uh, the writer mentioned that um, in 2004, for the first time, the Scott catalog decided to issue uh, or uh, include all of the Vichy stamps, whether issued or not in the colonies. Uh, and that uh, included 344 new entries. Uh, but there still seems to be confusion, even in the French catalogs, uh, about these stamps, where they were issued, and so on. This is the first one that uh, is a, uh, shows the um, uh, Peyton issue of, uh, that came out in November 1941 uh, at the Agence Comptable in Paris. Uh, and the question of where it was released, there were 48 values for the 24 colonies, a one franc and a two franc 50. Uh, I have reviewed and I'm publishing an article that will probably appear in the next issue of the Philatelist, which is basically my review of the available colonial uh, philatelic literature on the Vichy issues in the colonies from the 1960s going way back to Edmund Kiroy's article of 1962 in The Philatelist, up to the early 1980s, there was a, a series of articles in Colfra uh, about the Vichy issues. I reviewed that. There were contributions from De Rousseau, who lived in Indochina during the war, and also uh, Clement uh, Bourrat, who actually was a postal administrator in uh, French West Africa, which I will refer to by the French 
acronym of AOF. Uh, and he was actually on site during both the Vichy and the uh, Free French uh, administrations in West Africa. Uh, so he knew basically which stamps were available, which were issued. And, uh, and during the Vichy regime uh, from 1941 to uh, late 1942, when the torch invasion occurred in North Africa, uh, uh, when communications were completely severed from France as it was now totally occupied by the Germans, uh, there were uh, issues that were available uh, and released by the Vichy regime in French West Africa, including uh, the Pétain issue of 1941. Now, this cover, rather interesting, is obviously a philatelic cover that did not go through the mail. It was uh, created by the ship's purser of the Georges Leg cruiser. Uh, sent to a sailor uh, uh, of another uh, uh, ship stationed in Mar Martinique, which was the uh, Emile Bertin. Uh, and this does not have a receiver mark from uh, uh, Martinique, so presumably was processed locally on the ship with the Pétain issues. Now, uh, this is the, the the ship was at harbor uh, in Dakar at the time. Uh, in early 1942, the cancel shows uh, uh, the 12th of January 41, but I think this is an error where they did not update the uh, uh, millisime uh, uh, date stamp to 42. It was obviously uh, January 42. Uh, and it has the hexa hexagonal ship cancel. Uh, but again, I think it was processed locally on the ship and not sent through the mail. Um, and the stamps were obviously purchased in Dakar by the sailors. So the, the Pétain issue was available in all of the, uh, uh, well, in the uh, seven uh, West African colonies, but not Senegal. Oddly, that's where the ship was located uh, in Dakar, but the sailors uh, could purchase any of the other seven Pétain issues at the local post office in Dakar. So uh, this sailor bought the uh, Guinea set and uh, uh, made a philatelic cover. Uh, there are actually other covers available uh, uh, that are similar to this one, probably processed by the same ship purser and philatelist on board the ship, uh, one of which uh, uh, appeared in a uh, Robert Stone article from the 1970s. I don't know if that's the next slide or not, but we can go on to the next one. Now, this is an interesting one. I, I refer to Edmund Kilroy, who wrote one of the first articles I can find in the philatelist from 1962. I believe it was issue 115. And this is a cover I actually purchased from uh, Q. Roy in the mid 1970s as he was uh, just beginning to retire and uh, uh, close up his New York stamp business, which specialized in France and colonies. He was one of the original members of the uh, France and Colonies Philatelic Society. And he had a lot of contacts during the war with the colonies and was able to produce some very interesting items that probably a number of our readers have uh, seen over the years. But this is a, an original Q-Roy cover that actually did go through the mail it, as it has a St. Louis receiver mark from the 17th of November, 1942. Now this is the PEIQI issue. Uh, again, the French acronym for the uh, 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 defense of uh, the Children's Welfare Fund and Imperial Fortnite uh, stamp, uh, which is the blue one. Uh, and this was canceled in Bogue, uh, uh, Mauritania uh, on the 15th of November, 42. And now these stamps were orig originally released uh, with a quantity of 83,000 in June, 1942 in Paris. 
And supposedly, if you believe the delay catalog, 10,000 were released in uh, French West Africa, AOF. Uh, they carried fairly high catalog values on cover, like 460 euros, this one. But this one actually did go through the mail uh, from Bulgay to St. Louis in Senegal. Um, so uh, we can go to the next slide if there are more. <laughs> Uh, this is another interesting cover that I just received yesterday. I bought it from Del Camp. And the interesting thing is that in 1942, a series of air mails uh, for all of the eight French West African colonies uh, was released. Um, and the question is, which ones actually went to West Africa? Uh, now, uh, uh, Kilroy, uh, in his 1962 article, article, correctly stated that the 50 franc uh, email, uh, 50 franc airmail, was the only one uh, of the eight produced that actually reached the colonies. And he said that it uh, was released in late 1945 rather than the issuing year of 1942. Uh, and, and it was, he said, uh, late in the year to meet the demands for a high mail, high face value uh, air mail. Now, this cover actually is dated uh, earlier. It's a, a very good censored cover to Casablanca from the Ivory Coast, Sassandra. And it shows the 50 franc air mail uh, on this uh, legitimate. Uh, commercial cover uh, with the uh, uh, airmail uh, without RF, and it is January 21st, 1945, which is well before the end of the year. Uh, I don't know if you have the next one. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this this one was taken from the France and Colonies Philatelic Society of Great Britain. They published an article. Uh, uh, in April about the um, airmail route during the war to Geneva from French West Africa. Uh, they didn't particularly make mention of the rarity of the stamps on this cover, which includes five of the 50 franc uh, without RF uh, airmails uh, used actually in 1944, April 1944. And remember, this is before the liberation of France and the collapse of the Vichy regime. So these stamps were clearly available in West Africa well before the end of 1945. And Bourat, who was on site in French West Africa as a postal administrator, says that the stamp, the 50 franc stamp, but none of the other seven values were released in the West African colonies in late 1942. And it must have been before uh, communications were severed between France and the colonies when the Germans occupied uh, France on November 11, uh, 1942. Then mail would have been severed. Uh, so this, these stamps, but only the 50 franc uh, airmail was released in the West African colonies. This is a very interesting cover. Uh, it probably went by uh, Lufthansa and went through Portugal to Switzerland, uh, avoiding France, of course, which was still occupied at the time. This was uh, April 1944. And it did reach Geneva. It has both uh, Allied and Nazi censorship marks. Uh, see the German censorship in the lower right corner. Cover. Uh, is there another slide? I may be uh, up to my limit here. <laughs> yeah, you're you're at your time limit. And, yeah. Uh, okay. So, I don't so know what's your next slide. slide. Said, there are other interesting ones. They will be in the article, which will be published in the next collateralist. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Does yeah. anybody have a quick question for Tom? If you do, you can unmute yourself. Otherwise, we will go on. All right. 
Um, next, someone sent Ken these three unrelated items, but he was unable to tell me who it was. So if um, you are the sender, can you unmute yourself and you can talk about these slides? Yes, let's go to the, the next slide, please. Sure. All right, uh, we hear a lot about the colonies, but we frequently don't hear very much what happened in France. So I thought I'd choose uh, three items from France uh, from different time periods. The 12th International Aeronautical Exposition was put on from November uh, 6th through the 20th in 1930 and prior to that was issued the blue version of the stamp on the left without the perfin uh, but uh, in commemoration of the exposition the ultramarine version of that stamp was issued and uh, as part of the admission to the expo it got the perfin uh, when you paid your five francs Uh, so the total uh, was six six fifty for admission to the Salon du Grand Palais, and about sixty thousand were sold. Now the red version that you see there is is not authorized, and some enterprising individuals took the the die at night and uh, folded up a sheet and and perforated several of those. And you, there are many varieties that are available. You see uh, left, right, up, down, depending on how the sheet was folded. And in this particular case, you, we've got one with, with the perfin and one without. So that's uh, not authorized, but uh, there's enough of them around that, uh, that you do see them occasionally at auction. Uh, then the next slide, please. Uh, Telstar was a joint program uh, with many countries uh, put together by AT&T, Bell Labs, NASA, uh, the GPO in the UK, and the National PTT in France. And there were six, six ground stations, one in Andover, Maine in the US, Canada had one, the UK had one, West Germany had one, Italy, and then the Fran the the one in France was Plemeur Baudou. And its purpose was to provide satellite communication from continent to continent. And so on July 11th in 60, 1962, the first transmission from Andover, Maine to France uh, took place and it was a picture of a flag outside the Andover facility. And subsequently they did TV, radio, telephone communications, uh, and there were responses back and forth from France. Uh, the Russians uh, were doing bomb tests at the time. And so ultimately this particular, the transmitters on this particular satellite uh, went out of service in November, 1962. But subsequently, there were other satellites as part of this program. Uh, next slide, please. As part of uh, the initial transmission, the uh, PTT issued a commemorative sheet, uh, which you see on the, the left. And a letter was issued along with that sheet to participants in making this happen. And uh, it's a quite, they're a very limited number. There were a total of 400 sheets uh, put together. And so I, I think it's an interesting combination. Uh, next, please. Uh, everybody looks to take a look at their 40 centime series and see if they're the retouched version. And just to refresh, the stamp was printed in 150 stamps to a sheet. And when they first were uh, put together, uh, the auditors noted that 
position 146 and 47 were 20 cent in the, in the die. And so they had to rework it in order to get a four out of it. Well, naturally it's not gonna be identical. And so here we have a cover uh, with the retouched four uh, and you can especially see it on the lower left. It's more pronounced in the lower right. Uh, and what's interesting about that is the, uh, the Comptoir National Discount or National Discount Counter uh, was put together of, with 65 local banks created in a hurry in March of 1848, following the uh, financial instability, uh, the turmoil from the February revolution of that same year. And by 1852, most of the 65 banks had uh, disappeared when the government withdrew their financial support. Uh, and the one in Marseille was one of those that uh, also disappeared. And La Pochelle is, uh, is also not listed on one that survived that period. But this cover went from one branch to another. And when you open it up, it does uh, show a ledger of various accounts. And it's dated uh, Marseille, the 5th of June, 1850. And just a reminder that uh, those same dyes were used in the perforated version for 1870-71. So you also find the retouched variety in that. Thank you, any questions? Thank you, Bruce. I guess no questions at the moment. So let us proceed to Indochina. Uh, Richard. Good afternoon, I guess for most people. At least it is you're here in Colorado. You can move on please on the slide. During World War I, as, as indicated by this text, which I'm not going to read all of it, there were thousands, tens of thousands of Vietnamese, Cambodians, some Laotians, but not many, that were recruited to in labor corps and also in, in, in uh, frontline uh, battalions and also a medical staff, although we think most of the medical staff was, was simply or, um, orderlies and assistants. Now, I'm sure there, there would have been a lot of significant language problem with, uh, at that time. I'll move on. Um, again, I'm not gonna read all, all this, but this is, this is interesting postal history uh, uh, background. Next. Um, there are actually some, some lovely postcards uh, produced for this. And in, in parts of France, there are Vietnamese cemeteries for the soldiers who, who died during that time. But you can see most of it's labor corps, road repair, airfields, drainage works, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. There's, um, there's, you'll see on, on the next slide, um, there's an abbreviation AS, and I'm, I'm, I'm very confused. My French isn't very good as to what the AS says. Um, the Vietnamese at that time, because Cochin, China was a, a French physician, but the other two two portions of, of Vietnam were, were protectorate. And the, the Vietnamese at that time were called Annamites, which is a very much a derogatory term now. And, and note on the back of these, I don't know if we have them or not, but there's, there's Vietnamese written in Chu Nam, 
which is the uh, uh, before the total acceptance of of uh, the romanization that was uh, borrowed Chinese characters. Next. So here we have one. And what's this is this is interesting in several um, aspects. One, it's from a, a post morale address, and uh, post morale is literally a, uh, at that time a, a box or a can on on the side of the road, and and the traveling postman came around it and actually uh, applied the cancellation or marking, if you will. But it's addressed to uh, uh, number 18 AS. So if if we have some some French speakers, maybe they can help me dis, uh, discern what the AS was. But what is, is interesting is there's no marking indicating a free franc, but it, uh, it, it clearly went through the mails. Next, please. And this is the back of it with the receiver or actually a transit marking and the and the true nom characters they read with my limited vocabulary they read exactly what is written on the on the front of the letter now these were these were uh covers that were collected in france most likely simply because of the post royal markings and you can see here somewhat that that these um, these originated in Nam, which is a central part of 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 Vietnam. Cochin, China is the south. Tonkin is in the north, and Nam, uh, where Hue is, the royal capital, was in the center. Next, please. There must have been sufficient correspondence. Uh, to pay for or to to support pre uh, pre addressed envelopes, the Vietnamese themselves probably weren't illiterate, so they, it was being done by um, letter writers. And again, you you see a different a post morale marking, and on top there's a superscription. Uh, Correspondent to the military. Next, please. Again, the Chunam uh, written on the back, and and you can determine from this that uh, that the envelope wasn't sealed. But there's a nice there's a nice nice Paris receiver on the back also. So I'd like to hear more about this correspondence. Uh, these are the only, in, in, in 50 years of my experience, these are the only ones I've ever found. Next, please. And this one was apparently um, sent again from a NOM. And it was, uh, there's apparently after the free Franklin uh, a privilege expired as you can see there is a there's a there's a french postage due on on this one and this is addressed to where the psalm i guess yes next please again address and again a very nice uh, quite rare post morale large cancel marking Next, please. Um, that's all I have, Richard. Oh, that's all I have. Okay. I thought we were going to get in the introduction. There was there was something else mentioned. So, so that's um, it. Uh, all right. I I apologize for the mix up. I I know we got we were at last minute there. Does anybody have um, any comments or questions for Richard? Uh, it's Mick Vista here. Um, can I make a, a suggestion about the AS? Um, the initials AM would be Auxiliaire Medical. And I'm just wondering if AS is Auxiliaire Sanitaire, that he might have been a, a medical auxiliary. Sanitaire means more or less health 
auxiliary. Well, um, that Peter yeah, that makes good that makes good oh. sense. It's 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 much more possible than the, it's more practical. But again, it was it was auxiliary what? Oh, auxiliaire sanitaire, literally yeah. sanitary, but it means health. A, a okay. health auxiliary. But I'm, I mean, P Peter Stockton is with us. I, don't, I wonder if Peter might know because he collects World War One material. Peter? No, I haven't seen anything like that. Sorry. No. <laughs> Would you no, like no, to have I, these? I, I haven't seen it. I'm just thinking that you know, putting it into context. Uh, yes. Obviously, yeah, medical is quite common, but uh, it, it could be. All right. That, I'll try that on on the next version of the presentation. Yeah. Thank you. I'm done. Okay. Is that it, Richard? Um, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. The next one is mine. It involves uh, an advertising cover from uh, Courier de la Presse, which I call Google Alerts for the 19th century. So I have been inter always interested in advertising covers. And I think they tell us about the times and the society at the time. And so this one definitely caught my eye. Um, every bit of space other than the address space is taken up. There's not even a space for the postage stamp. This comes from a company called Courier, Courier de la Press, which was a clipping service. And there are four little vignettes at uh, the top of the cover. At top left is Direction, which shows a client describing his request for uh, information for alerts to someone at the company. Then there's Lecture, uh, which is the staff of readers that they have to read the newspapers and journals. Then in the upper right, there's decoupage. You can see that just to the left of the stamp is a group of uh, men sitting at a table clipping literally these uh, publications. And then depart, and there's somebody taking batches of them to the post office. And then at lower left are two of the newspapers that they clip from. And at the very bottom left is one of their clippings, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this is a card that the uh, company used for various correspondence. And I find it interesting because there's a picture of the building that they occupy. It was at 21 Boulevard Montmartre. It looks like from the fact that their banner spans the whole building that they occupied at least one floor of it, perhaps uh, both. That building is still there. It is located near Rue Drouot, which um, is the famous street of stamp collecting shops. And again here, uh, there is no wasted space. There are some uh, marketing information that is here um, on the left-hand side. And finally, here's one of the um, um, one of the clippings as they sent uh, sent out. Uh, you'll notice that this is a pre-printed form and it even has the month on it. So their volume was such that they had a new version of this form every month, which minimized the amount of writing that their staff had to do. And they paste the clipping on this little form and they mark, I've seen several of these, they mark with a colored pencil um, exactly what the client was looking for. And again, there's advertising along here on the side and down at the bottom, there's no wasted space at all on any of their documents. 
So there were actually two such services in Paris. Um, the second one was Argus de la Presse, which was actually founded a little bit earlier. Uh, Argus uh, comes from Latin, and we also have Argus in English, meaning an observant or watchful person. And I was able to trace that Argus continued into the 20th, into the 21st century. It was an independent company doing what was called media monitoring. So essentially the same business until 2017. And then it was absorbed by another company and still exists today. I've not yet found out what happened to Courier de la Presse and how long it lasted. And if anyone happens to know anything about these or have an idea of reference sources, I'd be um, certainly interested. So that's my presentation. If anybody has any comments or questions. Okay, we'll now take um, a trip to Martinique, uh, Dick Stevens. You will need to unmute yourself. I think you can hear me now. Yes. Uh, the uh, two cupboards that I am showing, he showing here, uh, this one uh, appeared on uh, Del Comp uh, a little less than two years ago. Uh, I've been a collector of Martinique for a long time. I've confined myself primarily to outgoing covers and have generally not paid much attention to incoming covers. But the idea of a cover sent from France uh, to Martinique, which was censored in the Union of South Africa, uh, struck me as quite unusual. Uh, and uh, that's what we have here. Uh, I didn't really expect them to buy it with a fairly low bid, uh, but uh, apparently uh, South, Af South African censorship collectors weren't interested in it. Uh, the South African tapes apparently are a fairly common variety. Uh, they're, not they're not tied. Uh, the uh, Mark, they were, they were censored in France, although on this cover, you cannot, you can barely tell, tell that since the French censor tape is under the uh, uh, South African censor tape. Uh, the tape with the brown tape tied by the oval is the South, is the Martinique censor showing that it arrived uh, and uh, Martinique sensor, the, each individual sensor had a hand stamp, which he placed on the cover, usually on the back, but sometimes on the front as, it, as here. Uh, the uh, May, May 13, 41, uh, it's a little difficult to uh, read the postmarks. Uh, The uh, uh, French Fort de France receiving mark uh, is uh, June 27th uh, in probably 1941. Uh, the year dates in the French receiving marks, the uh, Martinique receiving Martinique postmarks are uh, rather notoriously. Uh, difficult to uh, be certain uh, about. Uh, we go to the next slide. Uh, here is a second one. Uh, this one, uh, I found that I had, had uh, and have for a long time. Here you can see the French censor tape uh, with its uh, 
Marseille uh, marking on it. Uh, uh, the uh, this was actually part of the uh, Holzheiser collection, uh, and uh, you can see that I uh, really didn't have never mounted it. Uh, there's a one franc stamp which may be covered by your by uh, your pictures on the right hand side, uh, which is uh, it's both of these covers, but were supposed to go by sea mail, not by air mail. And there's been a great deal of publicity of articles recently uh, and uh, books uh, about uh, transatlantic uh, air mail during World War I. But there's been very little uh, I know of, uh, if anything, that's ever been written about what happened to uh, sea mail during World War II. Uh, the, certainly, uh, the Atlantic was not a very safe place uh, for ships uh, during 1941. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the this was sent by a returning banana boat from Martinique uh, to Martinique. Uh, the, I have a couple covers which show that these so-called banana boats uh, were taking bananas from Martinique uh, to uh, initially France and then to Morocco uh, after uh, they could no longer take them through the Mediterranean. Uh, whether this is just a single mail bag that got missent uh, and ended up in South Africa, or whether there's a greater story with it, uh, I don't know. And I, any of our members uh, know anything about a French mail ship or a French ship with mail? Uh, the uh, mail ships that are talked that Saul wrote about uh, ended were st ended. Uh, after the German invasion, uh, and uh, there's really no information about what what ships were running after that. I think that uh, covers what I can say about these uh, two covers. Uh, thank you, Dick. Um, any. Comments or questions? Okay, we'll go on to learn about Mrs. Simpson facsimiles from Jeff. Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> First slide, please. Well, this is an, uh, an early airmail related item. Those of you that collect the balloon covers from the siege of Paris during the Franco-German War or, or are interested in it may recognize this from uh, many auction in the past and also uh, these items have been written up and I classify this as a famous or an infamous uh, balloon cover from France to England. Uh, it basically is a facsimile and you can see that the Paris postmark is similar in nature to the original, but not quite. The stamps themselves, well, they are also facsimiles. The 20 centime blue is similar to what a stamp that was issued. The 20 centime, 20 centime bister, however, was, uh, was never a real stamp. And you can see in the lower left, uh, kind of a weak, London paid date stamp in red. So let's go to the next slide. I'm not sure 
what it is. Okay, so the interior of the letter uh, offers a very detailed description of the situation in Paris. And according to uh, the organization that created these facsimiles, they say that, uh, that this is a facsimile of a real balloon letter sent from Paris by the Celeste, that was the name of the balloon, on September 30th, wherein the handwriting, the Republican stamps, the postmarks, and even the size and weight of the paper are identical with the original. The names only being fictitious. So if you were to read this letter, it really does read like a, uh, an original uh, balloon letter. However, all of this is just made up for sale purposes. Next, please. No, forward, here we go. Okay, so this is an advertisement that appeared in the 1 April 1871 edition of the Times of London. And basically it describes uh, the situation in Paris, the use of balloons to take uh, mail out of Paris. And shows a picture of the Celeste balloon as it was landing. And again, at the bottom, you can see that this was prepared by uh, a company, Let's Sun and Company in London, and that you could buy these facsimiles, these letters that you saw in the previous slide for six pence each. Okay, and they claim that, that these uh, facsimile letters will claim a place in everyone's album or scrapbook. So that's how they were sold. And, and these appear on the market all the times. So I'd say 20, 30 years ago, they actually, uh, you could find them in auction uh, catalogs being described as real balloon covers. But nowadays, I think most of the word is out that we know that these are just uh, representative and they're not fakes, but they are facsimiles of a real balloon cover. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, now on the left is the cover that we already looked at, the original Mrs. Simpson letter. On the right is another Mrs. Simpson letter, very similar, okay? Well, the stamps maybe a little different shades placed in different locations. The same London paid, the same Paris mark, marking of 29 September, 1870. But the letter on the right shows some differences. One is a London date stamp from 1875. Another is the squiggle one and six, which we'll talk about later. Next slide, please. So the reverse of this second Mrs. Simpson cover. And what do we see here? Well, first of all, we see a Bombay date stamp, okay? 15 April, 1875. And over here on the left, a little difficult to uh, say, but actually, or actually to see, oh, where's my little cheat sheet here, it's missing. Uh, anyhow, it basically says that this letter was found in an unopened state in the letter box, okay? And then this, the signature of the postman who found this letter. So it appears that someone purchased the original Mrs. An original Mrs. Simpson, Mrs. Simpson uh, replica, and somehow it got to India. Now, whether that person purchased the cover from the firm in London and then had it sent there for his, you know, quote collection unquote, I don't know. But somehow it it, wound, it found its way to Bombay, and then, for whatever reason, it was picked up by someone and remailed back to Mrs. Simpson in London. 
not knowing that this was a fake letter, to them it looked like a, a, a you know a reasonably legitimate letter. So we have the Bombay date stamp on departure, several of them, and we have the London date stamp on arrival, May 31st, 1875. So this was, you know, four years after the uh, original facsimile letters were offered for sale. And we can see the postman in, in London wrote, not known without a number in Hereford Square, South Kensington, Southwest. So they tried to deliver this stamp, this letter to Mrs. Simpson, but obviously she didn't exist. So they had a very difficult time in finding them. Eventually, you can see from this, it was returned, okay, to the, basically to the dead letter office in London. And I, my guess is that they may have tried to return it to India, but if they tried to open the letter to see where it originated from, obviously the letter was written as it originated in Paris to a fictitious person in London. There's no uh, return address in Bombay other than the fact that yes, it is in, from Bombay, but no, no address from Bombay. So my guess is it stayed at the, at the uh, dead letter office and uh, eventually uh, somehow made its way onto the market. Anyhow, I just thought this was an unusual letter, an unusual usage of the facsimile uh, coming from Bombay and trying to be delivered to a Mrs. Simpson in London. So any questions? <laughs> That's it for me. All right, thank you, Jeff. I did a lot of reading and studying about the balloon mail a few years ago for articles that I wrote and I did not come across this, um, these facsimiles in this story. So I appreciate hearing it. So many great stories come from that time period. Right, yeah. Well, my guess it's going to be hard to find another one that was actually <laughs> placed yeah. into the mails at, right. in any location. So that, 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 That's the real capper of the story. So thank you for sharing that. Jeff? You're welcome. Yes? This is in basically incredibly coincidence, I guess you'd, you'd say, where you found it in an auction, I suppose? Yes. This came off a, a, an internet sale many years ago. Wow. Knowledge, now, knowledge is power. Yeah, yeah, well, that's right. And, and the thing that gave it away, the back wasn't necessarily shown. If we can go back uh, one yeah. slide. I don't know if we can do that or yes, not. But the thing, Hold on. Yeah, the thing that gave it away for me was it looked just like one of the others, but I, I said, well, why, you know, why is there a London date stamp on here? 1875, you know, the original facsimile letters never went through the mail. They were just sold as souvenirs. And then we had here the one and six, okay? And then I did, you know, I looked at what the rate should be. And there was a nine pence rate from India to Great Britain at this time. And there was a nine pence fine for an unpaid letter. So this was treated as a totally unpaid letter, not recognizing, first of all, it's a France, that the French stamps were bogus, but as far as India was concerned, they were of no value. So it was treated as a totally unpaid letter. So the nine pence plus the nine pence fine made this you know, one shilling six pence. That was the postage due. And right away I said, ooh, <laughs> that's really unusual. And then of course, when I saw the back of the letter eventually, well, everything kind of fell into place. Looks like somebody's written the word forgery on it. Yeah, someone has written forgery on here. I, I don't, it wasn't me and I don't know where that came from. It was on there when I got it. So I think, Maybe the person that actually had this and put it up for sale on the internet thought the whole thing was a forgery. Whereas in reality, I think just uh, the envelope and the stamps are the 
facsimile. I wouldn't call it necessarily a forgery. It was sold as a souvenir, not to, you know, not to defraud anybody. But the actual postal history of this item certainly uh, makes it not a forgery. Any other questions? <laughs> it's a shame our postal service isn't as thorough. I'm sorry? I said it's a shame that our postal service isn't this thorough. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're probably right. That's for sure. They wouldn't, they'd have looked at this and pitched it in the bin right away, probably. So at least the, uh, uh, you know, I, do I have a list? I forget. I, I did manage to uh, determine which ships actually carried it from India all the way to England. And uh, that all checks out, you know, time wise as to with the arrival date there. And uh, so, yeah. All the postal administrations from India to the P&O steamship lines and all the way to London, they all made an effort to deliver this letter. So good, good on them, as they say. <laughs> all right, okay. thank you. Thank you. All right, let's move on to St. Pierre Miquelon, Jim. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, why don't you start the first slide? Surprise me. Ah, there we go. The 100 franc airmail stamp. It shows a picture of the Potaz 840. The Potaz 840 was a French uh, airliner and uh, it was uh, built in France and uh, it was flown on a North American tour uh, in order to sell it to airlines as a possible uh, replacement for the DC-3 at the time. Uh, now, it flew around North America and somehow made it to the French colony of Saint-Pierre-Miquelon, which you see on the map there, just south of uh, Newfoundland. And uh, according to the stamp, it made a, a demonstration flight, if you want, from St. Pierre to New York City. Now, the problem I've always had with this stamp is did the flight actually take place? I mean, you can get a load of uh, philatelic first day covers that come from the philatelic agency in St. Pierre that'll cancel the stamp for you on a cover. But uh, after a search of many years, I'll show you what I came out with for a, if you want flight cover from this uh, a mysterious flight. Next. Okay, there's the trial colors uh, of, of the uh, uh, well known for the French colonial uh, uh, stamps of the time. And you can get proofs and imperforates. And like I say, first day covers are rather, rather common, none of which uh, were flown on the flight. Next. OK, there's the uh, plane in flight. It was uh, quite an advanced design for the time. Uh, four turboprop engines that could take 16 to 18 passengers with three crew. Uh, all metal airframe and a tricycle landing gear, which was uh, uh, unusual, certainly uh, uh, maybe an improvement from the DC-3. Uh, I wrote an article uh, on this for uh, the uh, Canadian uh, aerophilatelist uh, that explains, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, flights and the preparations uh, to tour this in North America. They were going to uh, manufacture the aircraft in Chicago if they could make some sales. Uh, eventually, they found that they got a deal from the uh, North uh, Irish uh, government to maybe uh, uh, manufacture the aircraft over there. 
but none of it ever came to fruition. Uh, part of the problem was uh, with the four engines uh, on the plane, that was four times <sighs> the expense of maintenance. Uh, also, uh, the uh, uh, most airlines of the time uh, we didn't want to improve their uh, uh, th their aircraft there. And I remember my first uh, trip in an airplane was in a uh, Viscount, uh, which was a British uh, turboprop at the time. So they went for uh, larger uh, seating arrangements for 16 to 18 passengers, uh, uh, I guess wasn't uh, giving enough profit to, to make this plane profitable for uh, the airlines in North America. You can see my article in here. It's kind of faint on my screen. Uh, I think you can make that out uh, if you go on to academia.edu with my name and my number is 231. Uh, you can scroll down and uh, besides a bunch of other uh, uh, French colonies and other articles. You can find the uh, uh, article on the Potaz 840. Uh, and give me the next slide, please. Anyway, this was uh, uh, part of the crew that flew uh, around and included the uh, president of the company, Mr. Potaz himself. Uh, he flew over, but he he flew over in a Pan American uh, uh, airliner. Uh, he didn't accompany the uh, Potaz 840 when it was being ferried over uh, for demonstration purposes. Next. Okay, this is uh, where I finally did, after many years of searching, come across a flown cover. And you'll see that it's addressed to uh, Mr. Quiroy. We've heard his name before. So uh, he had uh, sort of uh, uh, contact with the postal authorities uh, in the post office in the philatelic uh, office in St. Pierre. So he arranged, and you can see that uh, he also arranged for a registered letter. And you'll see that the back stamp is shown up on the uh, upper left here, which is uh, Times Square, uh, New York, uh, the day after the flight. So that's the only way it could have made to New York was uh, uh, on the flight. And uh, it, to me, offered proof that the flight actually took place. Uh, luckily, you needed a registered letter in order to receive the back stamp. Uh, and I recall uh, when I did come across this on eBay, uh, I think there were two of them offered and I just went for one. And uh, of course, it's a bit of a uh, crapshoot because uh, you needed that uh, receiving mark on the back to prove that the flight took place. And of course, you end up buying the cover just based on the face of the cover there. So uh, I got lucky on that one uh, with the right receiving mark uh, to make it quite a, uh, a rare first flight cover uh, of the Potaz uh, 840. Uh, next. Okay, I just might make a comment that uh, the other philatelic item that I had in the uh, in the article was a cover from the French uh, uh, Aviation Museum, where they used a, uh, uh, a a meter mark, which showed an outline sketch of the uh, uh, of the aircraft itself, the Potaz 840. Uh, uh, as a uh, that was sent out to uh, supporters of the museum looking for donations. So that was included in the article, which uh, is the only other philatelic article that illustrates the aircraft. So that was a, a pretty neat item. It's interesting to uh, look and to find these things uh, 
certainly the uh, the internet these days is a good place to uh, to do a search. Uh, time consuming, but uh, you come across uh, a couple of items that are uh, uh, filling filling in the blanks in your knowledge of uh, the philately. Okay, I think I'm uh, done unless there's uh, any quiet questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. All right, um, we had a contribution from someone um, about this stamp and I do not see that person present on the list of attendees. If you happen to be here, uh, please speak up. I yeah, guess. this uh, this is Ed Grabowski here. Yes, Ed. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, but is 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 that an imperforate one franc uh, olive green stamp uh, from the colonies? I believe it is. I I used to have uh, large numbers. I I bought a pile of them. Uh, they they were used as revenue stamps in Indochina. And and they were pen canceled. And I think this is just uh, if if it's the proper color and if it, the image was sharp enough that I could see if the stamp were real, um, uh, it simply may be an Ind Indochina fiscal usage of the one franc uh, teep sage. Ed Richard Asmus here. I agree with you. Okay, that takes care of that one. Yeah, I think it's a revenue stamp. Okay, this is all that I got from Ken. So, um, so we will move on to uh, Mick. Well, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Again, um, my uh, interest in in philately, philately is matched by my uh, interest in church, as it says here. Uh, and uh, during a uh, visit to France in 2018, and we were driving, my wife and I were driving down from Alsace to Burgundy. Um, I said, right, how about popping in to see this little church at, uh, uh, at Ranchamp? Uh, because we don't often go up to the Northeast and this will be an opportunity to go and see it. And uh, when I got back home, of course, two years later, or less than that, COVID struck. Um, it really gave me a time to do some research into uh, the uh, the background of the uh, of the stamp. As I've put down here, uh, I, I discovered its turbulent history and its somewhat uh, unusual uh, uh, philatelic history as well. And I, the, the one I put at the very bottom there is it sums it up. I owe my sanity <laughs> to the church at Ronchamp because it kept me occupied uh, for the best part of, uh, of one year. Um, Nice to see that item on the right. That is not mine. Obviously, Ken must have uh, must have uh, Ken must have found that. Yeah, that is a drawing from uh, one of the sketches taken or made by uh, Le Corbusier in the preparation of the design. Right, um, the next slide, then, please. Now, in the top left-hand corner, it's got a little map there showing the location of uh, of, of Ronchamp. Um, it's west of um, the town of Belfort and uh, about 30 miles from the Swiss border and about 50 miles from the uh, from the German border. Um, in the fourth century at uh, uh, where Ronchon is today, there was a hill known as the Colline de Bourlemont, and on it was a, a simple sanctuary dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And during the Middle Ages, the sanctuary was replaced by a chapel, the, the Chapelle de Bourlemont, again named after the, the hill. Fast forward to the uh, 18th century, and the chapel became a pilgrimage destination uh, and was uh, renamed the Chapel of Notre Dame du Haut, uh, Our Lady of the Heights, which is the name it's retained until the present day. Uh, during the French Revolution, uh, it was sold as national property. But in 1799, 40 local families in Ronchamp 
uh, decided to buy it back in order to restore its uh, original spiritual uh, vocation. Fast forward again to uh, August 1913, when the, the chapel was struck by lightning and the ensuing fire destroyed part of the building. Uh, the chapel was rebuilt in neo-Gothic uh, style in 1926. But again, during the Battle of uh, Bourlimont, which took place between September and October 1944, uh, between the Allies and the retreating Germans, uh, the, ch the chapel was severely damaged by, uh, by shellfire. So enough was enough for the locals. Um, so in uh, with discussions with uh, the uh, Diocese of uh, Besançon and the Commission for Sacred Arts, um, they called upon Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier, who was a neighbor, of course, an architect from Switzerland, because they believed he was the only architect uh, they believed capable of contemporary sacred architecture to design a new, uh, new chapel. And uh, on the 4th of April, 1954, the first stone of the uh, future chapel was laid. And just over a year later, in 1955, the new chapel of Notre Dame du Haut was consecrated. Um, so you see there the bottom left-hand side, the photograph of the chapel after its destruction uh, by, uh, by shelling in 1944. And on the top right, a photograph of the, um, of the, of the, new, the new chapel. Um, the uh, post office uh, decided in 1963 that it would include the chapel as part of their ongoing tourist series of stamps. And uh, Jacques Combe was appointed to design and engrave the, uh, the, the stamp. And the bottom left-hand photograph is Le Corbusier. And on the right is a photograph of the uh, designer of the stamp, the engraver of the stamp, uh, uh, Combe. Jacques, uh, Jacques Combe. Now, the, the photograph at the top, going back to that photograph at the top, um, this photograph was used in the uh, production um, of the post of the uh, of the stamp. And the photograph was taken by German photographer Hans Freytag. And he was really the inspiration for Jacques Combe's uh, design in 1963-64. And Combe was particularly taken by the shadows on the building cast by the overhanging uh, roof, which he faithfully reproduced in his uh, artwork, which we'll see now on the next slide. Uh, the, the, the two uh, items of artwork there, the maquettes uh, are not my property. They are currently in the uh, uh, Musée de la Poste in, uh, in Paris. And the, the first maquette at the, the top is in gouache and, uh, and ink. And it, portrays the chapel in a rather wintry setting, um, and it was rejected immediately. The second maquette below um, incorporates an, a, a cutout of a drawing based on the photograph by Hans Freytag. And around this cutout, uh, the background, which now evokes a, a sunnier uh, and happier setting, um, was completed in, in, in gouache. The design was adopted and the authorization to print this new stamp um, was given by the Minister of Posts on the 23rd of May, 19, uh, 1964. Um, there were two values of the, of the design and they were issued in traditional sheets of 50, uh, 50 stamps. There was a 40 centime for the overseas postcard rate and a one franc 25 for the internal registered letter rate. With the, with the latter one being printed and issued uh, first of all. Uh, the color trials you see in, in front of you uh, were produced in imperforate uh, sheets of 50 and were printed off three color rotary presses. And in each column of 10 stamps in the sheet would consist of three repeats of the three different monochrome impressions and then the one polychrome impression was uh, combined in the three inks made at the 10th stamp at the bottom. Now, I've only managed to get um, certain individual stamps here. I've not been as lucky as Jim Taylor, who managed to get a beautiful bottom of the sheet uh, uh, set of color trials. That's a magnificent piece. That's, a, that's an exhibition piece. Um, these are uh, 
more easy to, to, to obtain. But you can see the on the left hand side of the 40 something, the repetition of the monochrome. And then the top right hand side, you can see how the colors are combined for the bottom stamp to, uh, to show the, 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 th the three colors. And the, the, the final stamps are at the bottom of the page, the 40 centime there uh, on the left and the one franc 25 on the, on the right. Now, the, the printing of the one franc 25 took place first. It was a short printing for, um, in May and June 64, and it was issued uh, on the 13th of June and withdrawn in March uh, the following year, 65. So only uh, on sale for, for less than a year. But the 40 centime had a much longer life being printed uh, in from 1964 right through to uh, February 1967. And it was issued in February 65 and not withdrawn until April 68. And when the 40 was withdrawn, all the remainders, all the remaining sheets were sent to the post office in Rongchamp, which continued to sell them for two more years. Next slide, please. Now, the 40 centime uh, Ronchon is particularly associated with the experimental coil issue, which is the only coil in France to have been produced in a large landscape format. Now, on the left, the, um, the testing labels uh, show the portrait of Bernard Palissy. Now, the single portrait of Bernard Palissy first appeared in 1949 on test labels. And, it was printed in its double effigy that we see here uh, in 1964 for the testing and calibrating of experimental counter dispensing machines for use in post offices and, and, and the tabac. Uh, in America, you'll be familiar possibly with counter dispensing machines for coils, but certainly I remember um, dispensing machines like this when I used to go to the cinema and uh, you'd have a choice between the cheap ticket and the dear ticket, and they popped out of little slots in the in the counter in front. And it's that sort of device that was being tried now for the production of um, of stamp uh, stamp coils. Um, the policy coils were printed either in grey with red accountancy numbers on the back, and they're the more common ones you find and in deep blue, which is the one we see here with blue numbers on the back. Um, and the numbers, the accountancy numbers were on um, every, uh, every tenth uh, stamp. Clearly we see things doubled up here because the policy stamp has been produced in a, um, a horizontal large format. Now, following the trials with the policy test labels, printing of the 40 centime Ronchon coils commenced in uh, commenced, and there were we know that there were exactly one thousand eight hundred and eighty five of these coils uh, that have been recorded as having been produced, each composed of one thousand uh, stamps, uh, and they were were printed in March and April nineteen sixty eight, just after the sheet printings were being withdrawn from sale. However, the counter dispenser project was aborted and the printed coils were put into storage. 18 months later on though, on the 14th of November 1970, without any official announcement, 20 of these coils that had been kept in storage were delivered to the post office at Ranchon to supplement the remaining sheet uh, printings that were on sale there. Now, stamp dealers who managed to purchase strips from the coils obviously we sold them at exorbitant uh, prices. Uh, although I was looking to obtain uh, mine from the Paris dealer Georges Monteau at, uh, at face value. So I do know that I have got, um, in fact, a complete strip. It's not that one there, a complete 11, um, a strip of 11 of the, uh, of the first, uh, first issue. Anyway, to combat speculative prices and in response to complaints from dealers and the philatelic press, uh, further consignments of coils were taken out of storage and delivered in April 1971 to post offices elsewhere in France. And then later, uh, later again, in February 1972, more coils were issued to offices that had philatelic uh, counts, uh, uh, counters. Commentators originally claimed that the coils were the product of four distinct printings. 
identifiable by the changes in perforation, inks and gum. And I've got examples of all those changes. Um, and these differences were catalogued as such uh, in the early days um, uh, by, by Yves Antillier. Um, although these differences do exist, it's now accepted they're not indicative of specific printings. The printings just carried on one after another. And I think they were just putting any sort of paper, any sort of gum, and use whatever ink that was available at the time. They weren't uh, being very accurate uh, with being uh, consistent. Um, a final twist to the story um, is the disco discovery of a, a new type of accountancy number. Um, on all the coils I've seen, the numbers appear in duplicate in the lower half of the stamp. And you can see that at the top on the right hand side, that 920 is duplicated in the bottom half of the, uh, the, uh, the, the stamp. Um, but uh, in a small accumulation of the 40 centime stamps, which I found recently on Delcomp, I discovered this one example of a coil stamp with a single numeral in the upper half. Now, um, I'm going to write a little article about this and send, and send it off to one of the Philatelic magazines in, uh, in France to see if anyone can answer it. Um, it could be a, an experiment within an experiment, or perhaps someone is just playing around with his kid's toy printing set. I don't know. And at the bottom is a, is a photograph I took in uh, 2018 of Ronchamp trying to capture the exact angle and the same shadows. But clearly, um, I arrived a little bit uh, too late. The sun was too high in the sky and the shadows are a bit low. But um, it's, it's, it's a stunning sight to see this, uh, this chapel on the top of the uh, Colline de Bourlimont. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Uh, any, uh, any comments or questions? I, I don't know if you're aware, Mick, but there's a, a a fad or a meme going around with some of the uh, younger people who are doing uh, gladly related videos. Oh yeah. And and one of the things they do is try to duplicate with a current photograph a scene that is printed on a stamp. All oh, right. And and they call that extreme philately. And 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 had you what what they do is they pose with the stamp in the same view as the object depicted. Right. That's so, so if you had put the stamp in your photograph holding yep. it or something, you, you would have had a, a, an early version of extreme. I should have philately. had my yeah, I should have my wife in that photograph holding the stamp, shouldn't I? Yes. <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very interesting. All right. We are going to close with one last cover from John. Hello. Hello. Yes. I got the cover there. There it is. Okay. Um, I was just interested in. This cover is a glimpse into what might be France's most obscure colony. And it was um, from Moali. The postmark is um, November 13th, 1906, from Moali, then a, um, identified as a dependency of Mayotte. It was sent to the neighboring island of Anjouan and to somebody with a very long name and pile of titles. And it was, well, well the, the stamps had up to 35 centimes for registered a uh, mail. And it was returned to sender because the recipient was deceased. You see Decide all over the cover on the front and on the back. And as to who was the sender, it turned out to be the upper left corner of the Arabic. There's a min. Um, which I assume everything following the min, which means from in Arabic as the recipient, excuse me, as, as the sender to whom it was returned. On uh, the back, there were some very faint blue um, 
uh, back stamps in the, there were double octagonal marks. I could not make out any lettering, but they're consistent with the postmark for Anjuan. Uh, I'm not sure if there's much more to say, but if anybody finds anything, sees anything more in this cover, I've not been able to find anything out about either the recipient or uh, the sender, but it, I think it's small enough a place that I might be able to figure that out. Okay, thank you. Thank you, John. Any comments or questions? Okay, so we've gone an hour and a half. Very good. I think that is just about right. Um, any other questions uh, relating to any of the presentations? Any thoughts? Otherwise, I will stop recording and we will close the meeting. Uh, yeah, Ed, Ed Grabowski again here. Just a couple of quick thoughts on, just the quick comments on, on four of the presentations. Uh, with respect to the perforated initials on the airmail, I got to expertize one of those way back when, when I did expertization for the APS, and I knew nothing about the stamp. Uh, I looked up the, the characteristics of the perforation in, in the Iver catalog, and then I looked closely at the stamp I was expertizing, and it turned out somebody had punched the holes with a one-hole puncher. And, and they were not at all in line, and it was very obviously, obviously a fake. Uh, uh, Mick, uh, just a comment to you. My wife and I visited the chapel in 1970 uh, and had a, had a grand time there. Uh, I, I, I noted the stamp affiliation, but it, it never, never caused me to do any collecting. Well, I congratulate you because Ronchamp is, is tucked away in a part of France that people rarely visit, you know, you have to go out of the way, I think. Yeah, well, we, 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 we had a little Renault and we were circumnavigating France counterclockwise uh, yeah. at the time. <laughs> we, were in, we were there for five weeks. So we had, we had some time for the minor sites. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, you're, Jim, the only person, <laughs> you're the only I, person I know that's, that, that's seen it. <laughs> uh, Jim, on your airplane, I was I was glad you mentioned the Vickers Viscount. Uh, I took my first airline flight on a Vickers Viscount uh, in 1965. I went from Rochester to Philadelphia, and all I'll say is the trip took 14 and a half hours, uh, and I won't say anything beyond that. It was quite an adventurous journey. Uh, and uh, Jeff, just one comment for you. I, I think the balloon monte rate uh, to England from France was 30 centimes. And I believe both your covers had 40 centimes. Is that correct? Yeah, I think what happened was is they, they made one die for these fictitious stamps. And, and they made a 20 centime die. And they printed them in different colors because normally the 20 and the 10 in, in this bister color was typical of 30 centime rate, but you know, they did the best they could with <laughs> what they had. Okay, those are my comments. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Yes, thanks, Ed. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to stop recording.